Okay, so welcome everybody. Welcome to our course on federated learning. So it seems uh, you have found the right information because you are here. So uh, our main uh, information channel will be the My Courses page. So please make sure uh, that you have access to the My Courses page. And I assume those here have access. Does anyone have problems? with accessing my courses? No, very good. Okay. Yeah, uh, so let's jump uh, into the schedule, the lecture uh, course schedule. Uh, the course is based on, on plain old lectures like this one today. So we will have around 10 lectures, uh, some of them given in person, by me here uh, in this lecture hall. So the first, the first three lectures now will all be in this room uh, on Mondays at quarter past four and on Wednesdays on quarter past four. And uh, we will end the lecture by six, maybe earlier. Okay. Um, yeah, we will also have guest talks. This was a, a a student request from, from last edition. The students would like to see uh, industry, um, federated learning industry. And to this end, I have invited now uh, two guest speakers from industry, one uh, from Flower Labs. Did any one of you use already Flower Labs or a uh, library from Flower Labs? So uh, they could use software libraries like Python packages that allow to do federated learning. But uh, of course, you will first learn what federated learning is in the first few lectures. Uh, then we have a second guest talk from uh, Sweden, a startup from Sweden called Scale Out. And they also provide uh, software solutions for federated learning. So you will get first hands information about how these theoretic concepts that we talk about in this course is implemented in practice. Okay, we also have uh, a guest talk from, from Nokia. Uh, they also give insights how, how Nokia uses federated learning, uh, also in research. And uh, I also have uh, the pleasure to have a guest speaker from Italy, uh, Professor Vasio, he's an expert on privacy preservation. So that's the rough overview of over the lectures. Uh, the, the themes of these lectures, they can they are roughly grouped into, into three blocks. So we have first block is a machine learning refresher. So the first lecture next Monday, and maybe we'll start a bit today to refresh your, your machine learning knowledge. Uh, and another lecture, uh, which is but already towards towards federated learning is gradient methods. So let me ask how many of you have taken a first course on machine learning? Yes, so I guess you're all familiar with fitting a linear regression model or a deep neural network to some data points. Uh, so this will be a refresher. We will uh, go fast or a bit a bit uh, faster than in the other lectures. And uh, yeah, how many of you have ever learned uh, about uh, gradient descent? So you could, for example, analyze the convergence rate of gradient descent. Very good, also a few. So this might also be uh, uh, to some extent a refresher, but maybe I, I offer you a new perspective that is particularly useful for, for federated learning. Yeah, the second part is uh, federated learning theory and methods. So I try, of course, I try to, to not emphasize it too much, but we will use mathematical theory in this course. But I hope to convince you that the mathematical theory that we use is very useful for designing systems, for really implementing federated learning on your laptop, for example. Okay, uh, so this is part two, uh, which consists of uh, lecture federated learning design principle, uh, where you will learn how to formulate the federated learning problem as an optimization problem. So uh, do you know an optimization problem formulation of basic machine learning? How do you formulate a machine learning problem? More or less. So we will refresh this in the in the first lecture. There's a formulation called empirical risk minimization. So 99% or even more of machine learning and in turn of AI is a variant of empirical risk minimization. And we will briefly 
uh, refresh this in the machine learning basics lecture. And a similar principle or a special case of this empirical risk minimization is our federated learning uh, design principle, which I call total variation minimization. So much of this course will be uh, uh, to understand the solutions of this total variation minimization problem. Okay, then we have uh, a lecture called federated learning algorithms. This is uh, basically the application. So you just use gradient methods as one important class of optimization problems to, to solve uh, total variation minimization. Okay. Yeah, please interrupt me anytime. So this lecture should be interactive. I can easily fill an hour, an hour. I can easily fill eight hours talking uh, without breaking sweat or not too much sweat, but please uh, ask questions and interrupt me along the way. Okay, so we have a lecture on federated learning algorithms where we apply gradient methods to total variation minimization. Then we will have a lecture that teaches you how to find uh, network structures in data because this total variation minimization principle uh, builds on a, on a network or I call it empirical graph, a graph structure. And uh, this is a design choice as we will see, but sometimes it's good to, to get a data-driven method to learn these similarities between data. And this will be discussed in the graph learning lecture. Then uh, this is then already the, the third part. So the third main block of this course is on trustworthiness. Uh, how many of you have heard the seven key principles for trustworthy AI? One. Again, the seven key principles of trustworthy AI. How many of you have heard it? Again. Okay, so it's really a small subset of those who have taken a first course on machine learning. And uh, I also blame to some extent myself because I also used to teach machine learning by focusing on, on mathematics, on coding, on implementing algorithms, but not uh, put enough emphasis on the main component of machine learning, which is we humans, because we humans use machine learning. And this I try now to change a bit by explicitly having at least one lecture in this course where we discuss these key principles of trustworthy AI. And this might become actually more and more relevant also regarding uh, job market, because uh, there might be more and more uh, uh, risks of getting sued as a machine learning company or some company who has a smartphone app that uses machine learning, uh, but not in a legal way. Okay, then, uh, yeah. We have the two final lectures, which is uh, one about privacy protection. This was basically the main uh, the main selling point of federated learning in the beginning, or one of the main reasons why this federated learning became so popular, because it allows to to learn from collections of data, like uh, hospital data, uh, patient data, without requiring to share the raw data. So federated learning is somewhat privacy friendly. It's not perfectly privacy friendly because uh, this is quite uh, trivial. If there would be no information exchange at, at all in a federated learning system, then why on earth would you do federated learning? So why should you ever bother looking at the other data sets? So there must be some information exchanged in a federated learning system, but we have, uh, to some extent, we can control which part of the information is exchanged. And a particular, uh, you only might only need patient data that doesn't reveal the identity of the person of the patient, but which is useful to learn uh, a predictor for uh, a stroke, a uh, risk of a stroke, given the, the uh, physical parameters of the person. Okay, so we will look at uh, privacy protection in the uh, a penultimate lecture, and the last lecture is about poisoning in federated learning. So this is related to cyber security also. Uh, hot topic getting hotter and hotter. Uh, so in, in, in general, in machine learning uh, or in federated learning, but also in, in machine learning, the idea is to learn from data. So that's that's the, the basic idea. You, you fit the model to data without using too much guidance from an, from an expert like I. A long time ago, I, I studied electrical engineering in Vienna. And I learned how to design filter signal processing algorithms. So this was designing models was based on, on skills, on knowledge that has been 
propagated over generations of, of signal processing engineers. And nowadays you just take your most fancy model that you just know. So what is your, what is the most fancy deep learning structure or deep neural network at the moment? Which network structure have you heard about in the media? LLMs, so what, what is the structure they are using or one, one transformer network? So now currently I, I, have, I have witnessed several of these hypes and now the recent hype is transformer networks. A few years ago, it was, it was LSTMs, then it was deep CNNs and now it's transformer networks. So let's see how long this, this wave lasts before the next cool architecture comes along. But the idea is then you take your transformer network, super powerful big network, and you train it on data. But uh, uh, how, can you know, how can you know that the, trata, that the, the data is, is trustworthy? So does anyone of you know uh, where these LLMs have been trained? So you, you, need a lot of, you need a lot of training data. How, how did they construct the training data for LLMs, for transformer networks? Yes. Yes, scrambling internet sites. And how do you know if the information from an internet site is trustworthy? What, what is the most trustworthy internet site or, or en encyclopedia, uh, uh, like uh, Wikipedia? So do you trust Wikipedia? No, very good. Don't trust Wikipedia. In particular, bi biographies of people like professors or politicians, which are edited by some uh, edit uh, by people with very funny IDs. So you could you could and as I understood, so I didn't. Uh, I'm not an expert on LLMs, but as I understood, Wikipedia has been used to some extent to train these transformer networks. So anybody or any state actor like uh, Austrian Austrian criminal organization, for example who can uh, fiddle around or manipulate a bit, a lot of Wikipedia sites, a lot of Wikipedia pages from some political party, for example, might be able to mani manipulate the LLMs then, that in the end, you have a certain uh, a tone in the responses of the LLM. Okay, so this is related, uh, this was now a bit off, <laughs> off the road, but it's related to poisoning. So how can we find out poisoning? How can we find out if a data set is, is not, uh, is intentionally, Modified and how can we uh, protect ourselves against it? We will discuss this in one lecture, in the last lecture. Okay, any questions at this point? That's basically the menu that I can offer you or that I will offer you in this course. Yes, okay, uh, very good question. So uh, this course is, uh, by default, it's a five credit course. So we will have these 10 lectures and uh, assignments, which I will talk about in a second. Uh, and this is worth five credits. And if you are uh, enthusiastic and want to extend to 10 credits, you can do so by doing a project. So, uh, and this project amounts to picking up any topic you're interested in. So choosing your data set and applying some of the methods that we, we uh, discuss in this course to this data set and report the results. So you have to write a, a report, a, a project report. And uh, another component of this project is you have to peer review, uh, evaluate others uh, reports. And to this end, you, you will get a template for the project report and you will get also a template for the peer review questions. So this is pretty much guided. As I understood, some students are not very happy with peer review. So did did any one of you ever do peer review in, in some course? Not too many. Is anyone uh, really uh, strictly against peer grading or peer review? Or does anyone have a very good argument against it or what could be challenging? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other comments? 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we make it quite narrow, very strict. So you can only use methods that we discuss in this course, which of course still has a lot of design freedom. And uh, we also uh, share with you a draft for the peer reviewer questions. So we will have then another lecture where we use a, a bit of another lecture to get your feedback. So you can comment on, on the peer review questions that we uh, plan to have for you. So you will, will have uh, some influence in this, how, how we design it. But I would say this is not so uh, urgent at the moment because uh, this, uh, this student project, let me see if I put the deadlines, more info here. Yeah, so the deadlines, uh, the tentative deadlines will be to submit the, the first version of the project report will be 31st of May, so there's still a bit of time. And also, I mean, the whole point of the project is that you apply some of the methods from the course. So of course you you, you can go ahead and work through the material, but uh, ideally you, you follow also the lectures a bit. So maybe you will not start on the project now, maybe then in April. And yeah, I should also mention, uh, so we have uh, this peer review period, which is basically whole June. So you have time during the June to to review uh, five, maybe three to five other project reports. Uh, then we collect all the peer reviews and then you have to do a final submission. And in this final submission, you have to explain how you took into account the peer review. So I want to, I want you to practice this, this cycle of getting feedback from peers and using the feedback from peers to improve. That's the, that's the main operation mode in science, I would say. You, you get peer review, critical peer review, constructive peer review, uh, and you use it to improve. And you have then the final submission consists of the, of the revised project report and a response letter. I will also uh, share with you a template for the response letter where you explain how you took the, the feedback into account. I mean, one, one example for a response letter, I have also posted here, uh, where I explained how I took into account the, the peer feedback received from the students in the last edition. So I explained how I took into account the student feedback in this course and changed the course. Okay, so that's about the, the project. Any other questions about the project at this stage? Okay, they're not. Uh, yeah, then um, I assume Many of you, I, uh, well, I'm, I'm sure may, mo all of you take the course because you want to learn something about federated learning, but maybe you also want to have a grade or a certificate. So how we do the grading, the grading is based uh, in the end on, on quizzes. So we have here the first quiz uh, and each quiz corresponds to a lecture. So for each quiz, you have a corresponding lecture and this should be clear from the, from the title of the, of the quiz. So this quiz, Machine Learning Basics, starts on Monday, maybe. Maybe I'm considering opening it a bit earlier so you get a bit more time for the first quiz to get used to the format. And the quiz uh, tests uh, your understanding of the lecture. So if you carefully follow the lecture, you should have no problem to answer the, the theory questions in the quiz. And it tests your solutions to a coding assignment. So for each uh, lecture, after this welcome lecture, but for each following lecture, we have a, a coding assignment that you find uh, here in general, here on the notebook. So here you find, so it's all, uh, the, 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 the material is mostly on my GitHub uh, account. So you can find here the, the notebooks for the assignments, for the coding assignments. So here would be, uh, machine learning basics. This would be the notebook for the first coding assignment. Yeah, and uh, in, uh, there I take the opportunity to ask uh, Alexander, my TA, to introduce himself. Hello. Is he still here? Hello. Yes. Yes. Could you... Yes, I, I'm still here, and uh, I'm also Alexander, and I'm the course assistant. And I'm responsible for the Slack discussions about the coding assignment and the quiz questions. 
So if you will encounter any difficulties, uh, maybe ambiguities uh, with the quiz questions or coding assignments, if you will find any bugs or you will want to discuss the problems, you can freely uh, text me on Slack uh, and uh, I will try to answer you. You can also contact me with the technical issues if you will uh, have any missed deadlines or uh, some broken links or whatever is possible. You can also freely text me. So, I so, hope you will. So, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, so the, the main person for, for the assignments, the coding assignments and the quizzes, the mastermind behind the quizzes is uh, Alexander. Uh, let me go back. Yeah, and you can reach out to him. So he mentioned already, uh, we have a Slack channel. So where is it here? Did I send you? Yeah, here. Here is the, the link to the Slack channel, but this is voluntary. You, you don't have to, to use the, the Slack channel, of course, uh, but you're very welcome to use it. And uh, what did I want to say regarding the quizzes? Yeah, you find here the, the deadlines for the quizzes. So when we open it, the first quiz opens at the uh, 4th of March and goes till uh, ends 10th of March. If I remember correctly, we end the quizzes always on Sunday, one minute before midnight. Okay. And uh, yeah, just uh, to say up front, there will be no excuses. So all these deadlines are strict. There is no extension under no circumstance. And uh, of, I understand that uh, this might be st sound stressful, uh, but I, I want to highlight that in the end of the course, you have the opportunity to review all the grading uh, of all the uh, all the quizzes, and uh, you can also. Uh, uh, cover up for missed points during an, an, this interview or during this review with me. So it's basically an, an oral exam in the end. Because for, for one reason or the other, you might have a challenge with one of the quizzes. You don't have time, something urgent comes up, or uh, you, you misunderstand the task. So don't worry about this. You have the chance to, to compensate in the end of the course. Any questions regarding the quizzes and coding assignments? Yes. With all the coding assignments, I checked uh, Jupyter Hub in Alpha before. There used to be like an old server for federated learning, but I don't see it anymore. So it's still possible to do the assignments with the Alpha Jupyter. Yes. So with the channel. Yeah, very good point. Maybe I'll show you. i show you. So uh, you can use whatever you want to, to work with Python notebooks. But one way is to use uh, super, uh, the, this Jupyter Hub server from our department. So if you Google Jupyter CS Alto, you find it. And you can use this uh, general, the first one. So let me, let me briefly open it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay, so then you can upload, uh, for example, I have, for some reasons, I also have the solutions, <laughs> but not you. Uh, so then you can upload here this coding assignment and then you can work on it, it should work. Uh, we didn't, um, I'm not sure if we tested it, but it should uh, support everything uh, out of the box. Yeah, so this is the first coding assignment. Yeah, uh, regarding prerequisites, we assume you, you are familiar with Python using numeric arrays, fitting uh, basic uh, machine learning models using a uh, ski kit learn package. Otherwise, I mean, you, you, can, you can of course cover up for, for missed uh, or for missing prerequisites yourself, but we do not offer too much support for this. Okay, where was the...
yeah, um, yeah, maybe now if I'm here already. So you find you should then look out in these notebooks for student task. So your first task is to spot the student tasks. <laughs> so student task one here, and then uh, Alexander has prepared a, a, a short explanation what you should do, train a linear model using the linear regression class of Skikit Learn and uh, determine the resulting training and validation errors. So that's not too hard, I, I hope, in the beginning. And uh, we might then in the quiz ask about the, the error levels. So are the, is the error between 15 and 30 or between 30 and 50? So this will be quiz questions about the, the coding assignments. And here we have one, two, three coding assignments. So not too much. Okay. What else? Yeah, so in this uh, nine quizzes, so we have nine quizzes for all lectures except the one today. I will not test the course logistics. Uh, so we have nine quizzes and you can collect in total 100, 100 points. There is no minimum requirement for any individual. So you can collect the points uh, for whatever quiz you want. There's no individual minimum requirement. And then we, we add up all your points and then we determine your grade according to this rule. So grade one for 50 to 59 points, from 60 you get grade two, from 70 you get grade three, and the best grade, top grade five from 90 points onwards. Okay. Yes, then about the project I talked already. What else? Yeah, I also mentioned you can, uh, in the end, you have the opportunity to, to book an uh, interview with me. Let's call it interview, uh, where we review all your, your uh, submissions to the quizzes. And uh, you can also then uh, cover up for missed points. So if you can answer some questions during this interview, you get uh, you can re-earn this or recollect these points to improve your grade if you want. So this should should take away uh, stress because uh, also these quizzes only have one attempt. So uh, during this period for for the quiz you have one one shot so to say, and this one attempt uh, is maximum two hours. So I highly recommend that you go through the lecture, the lecture notes for the corresponding lecture and the the lecture itself. Also the recording, so I record all these lectures and put them on YouTube. And you work on the coding assignment. Only then start the quiz. That's my advice. I cannot force it. Uh, but then you have two hours. So if you if you like uh, excitement, you can also start the attempt directly when you start the attempt, and you have two hours. Like mission mission possible mission. Possible. Uh, and uh, yeah, you have one attempt in this period. And after the quiz deadline, we release the reference solution. So we uh, show you how one could have solved the, uh, solved the coding assignments. Okay. That's about the course logistics. Yeah, uh, also I want to highlight uh, two ground rules. So you are part of, uh, of the Alto community. Uh, as students of an auto course. So please remember you must act according to the auto code of conduct. Uh, you find a link to the auto code of conduct uh, in the lecture notes. And just to remind you about two, two main ground rules here. Uh, first one, uh, be honest. So uh, we will randomly select some of you uh, in any way and uh, ask uh, the one who are selected to explain their solutions for the quizzes. So you can chat as much as you want with anybody. You can uh, ask for help for anybody, but you have then to defend your solutions. And if you cannot do it, uh, we, we uh, need to yeah, report this uh, and, and decide case by case. Because uh, you also have as a student, uh, you, you have to follow the code of conduct, which is 
uh, you should not uh, use others verb or other solutions in your name. So when you submit the quiz, then I expect that you know why you choose these answers. The second rule, the second main ground rule is be respectful. So I'm a very kind person, but I, I lose my temper if I see any form of disrespectful behavior. So uh, I want this to be a safe space for all of you who all want to learn together federated learning. And if I, if I experience any form of disrespectful behavior also in any of the uh, platforms, discussion platforms, I will have no mercy and will report this also to, uh, to the higher levels at the university. So we don't take this lightly. Okay. Yes, that's it for, for the introduction. Are there any questions about the course logistics?